So Final Fantasy X ends like this. Never forget them. And Final Fantasy X-2 opens like this. Never in all my days have I experienced tonal whiplash of this magnitude. About a year ago I made a video about how Final Fantasy X is one of my favorite games of all time, and how it's extremely cohesive. In fact, the last thing that I wanted to do after beating Final Fantasy X was play the sequel because to me, it was such a tight-knit game with such a meaningful ending, and I didn't feel like more would actually add to the experience. Not only that, but a lot of people seem to hate this game, saying that they ruined Yuna's character and that the tone is nothing like the original games. Well, I'll give credit to the critics where credit is due. The second part is entirely true. The tone is very different, but given the direction they went with this game, it makes a lot of sense. After the events of the first game, we're dealing with a completely different version of Spira and a completely different version of Yuna. The tone of the game reflects Yuna's outlook on the world, the things she does, the things she surrounds herself with, and the things she says are all different ways of hiding her sadness, and these things reflect on the tone of the game as a whole, almost as if you were seeing the world through her eyes. I think these things are pretty clear to people if they've beaten Final Fantasy X, and if you for some reason only played X2, you might just see a weird lady running around with her two lesbian best friends while occasionally playing dress-up. Which, don't get me wrong, I imagine it's awesome on its own, but without the context, without the full understanding of the nuance, it might not hit the same. I'm not for a second gonna act like this game isn't out there, especially compared to how consistent Final Fantasy X was with the rules of its world and its tone. I'll just say that X2 takes a different approach one that sees Yuna, formerly a religious practitioner, you know, a summoner, becoming a J-pop idol. After the events of the first game, people have become much more willing to accept the Albed and the use of Machina, which means that in the two years between this game and Final Fantasy X, whole new industries, pastimes, and forms of entertainment have been born. You notice as you traverse the world, revisiting familiar locales, that there's much more casual use of technology. You get stopped in Luca by Shalinda, who is now a news reporter, formerly a religious practitioner, and you see a microphone and a camera. Nothing that's too stunning on its own, but given how taboo even the slightest use of tech was in Final Fantasy X, it tells you how different the world scene in this game is. When you go to the Xanarkin Ruins, which used to be a holy place, you see how it's just become a tourist attraction, overrun by people gawking at it and you see people talking about how exploring the ruins would be a scenic adventure, knowing that this is the exact place where a ton of terrible things went down in Final Fantasy X. This is one of the first times in X2 where you just see Yuna drop the act. She's completely dejected. She doesn't like what's happened to Xanarkand, but she doesn't tell them to stop. You see that even Riku's dad, Sid, is in on it, which is an interesting moral dilemma for our protagonists. The game may appear to be super weird and full of tonal inconsistency, and that's fair, but there's a fair amount of depth below the surface. Not quite as much as Final Fantasy X, but still a fair amount. The structure of this game is also completely different from Final Fantasy X, to the point where it's almost jarring. Final Fantasy X is a notoriously linear game where you follow the beaten path pretty much until the end, occasionally engaging with optional minigames like Blitzball or Chocobo Riding. 10-2 is also linear by definition, but not in the same way as its predecessor. From the very beginning of the game, you're in the airship, and you're free to travel to any location from Final Fantasy X. It's a great amount of freedom from the get-go, but it's a little weird that the majority of locations in the game were also in the previous one. It's the only aspect of the game I can think of that comes off as a little cheap, but at least they updated each location with some tiny details that really give off the feeling that time has passed. 
The game is split up into chapters, and in each location on the map, there are objectives that are time-sensitive, meaning they can only be completed during a specific chapter or specific range of chapters. Like, for instance, you can only find this item during chapters 1 through 3, or something like that. I've probably gone through somewhere between dozens and hundreds of pages worth of guides just to know what to do and when. Because guess what? This game has multiple endings! And it's not just a good ending, bad ending type deal, it's more of a explicitly happy ending, sad ending. In order to get the happy ending, I have to do a ton of side stuff, and this constant feeling in the back of my mind is one of the only things that took away from my playthrough. I was enjoying everything I was doing, except checking off a very stressful checklist. I just want to see Yuna get a happy ending. Now, here's where my opinions get really controversial, okay? I think that Final Fantasy X-2 has one of the best battle systems in the entire series. A lot of Final Fantasy X's depth came from its unique progression system, the Sphere Grid, which allowed you to use points to spend on new abilities and stat increases. Because of the Sphere Grid, Final Fantasy X didn't have a traditional leveling system. Even though X-2 returns to more basic and traditional systems than X, sporting the Actor Time battle system and traditional leveling, the depth of the Sphere Grid is not lost in this game. Rather, it's been transferred to the Dress Sphere system. Dress Spheres are like classes or jobs. White Mage, Black Mage, Warrior, Thief, and way more are all back in a big way. The thing that makes Dress Spheres unique is that you can switch between them on the fly in the middle of a battle, which opens up strategic possibilities basically from the beginning. They can be found all over the map, and the three main party members each have unique Dress Spheres that only they can use. Of course, Dress Spheres are nothing without Garment Grids, the layouts that you can place them on. You can't just switch to any class you want, you have to equip specific classes for specific characters by putting them onto Garment Grids. They all come in different shapes and sizes, be they circular, or triangular, or whatever this is. One of the big reasons why this is important is because you can't just move to a random spot on the grid, you have to move to a sphere that is directly connected to the one you have currently equipped. There's as much strategy involved in selecting the grids and spheres outside of battle as there is actively switching between them in battle. The only way to figure this out is by actively trying out all the new dress spheres you get, seeing which sticks and the ways in which you use them. Believe me when I say, this game is flexible. There may only be three main party members, but by the end, it feels like ten. They're all capable of fulfilling a bunch of unique roles. I thought that Yuna would be my white mage most of the time simply because she was the healer in Final Fantasy X, but I found it was actually a better fit to have her be my black mage. Riku, who was more of a thief in Final Fantasy X, ended up being my best warrior, and Pain, who was a warrior by default, ended up usually being a festivalist, which is a bizarre class that functions as support by causing statuses like blindness and putting up protective walls, all with festive aesthetics like fireworks. Actually. The existence of the Festivalist is kinda indicative of the tone of this game. I mean, just think about the name Dress Fear for a second. Not only is it a cool combat mechanic, but it's a fashion one too. And I'm not gonna lie, I was always curious to see what unique outfits each character would wear when I unlocked a new Dress Fear. This game's soundtrack is also incredibly underrated. While the Final Fantasy X OST came off as super cohesive, with a mix of memorable melodies and ambience at times, this game leans way harder into the former. It doesn't really reuse any motifs from the previous games, or from the series at large. When you finish a battle, you won't hear the victory fanfare, you'll hear... When you go to Xanarkand, you won't hear the iconic, Someday the Dream Will End, which, by the way, was my favorite segment of Final Fantasy X. Instead, you'll hear... The vibes of this game's soundtrack are impeccable, and it's thanks to the composers Noriki Matsuda and Takahito Aguchi. 
Uematsu had no involvement in the OST of this game, giving it a really unique feel that I think only works for Final Fantasy X-2. It's just so frenetic and bombastic and groovy all the time. I love it. Some standouts for me are the main battle theme. And also the theme that plays when you're in the airship. Guys, I don't know about you, but I can't argue with that baseline. A lot of the music in this game, just like the combat, just like the tone and the presentation, it's all just very fun. The key to Final Fantasy X-2, to me, is fun. It's fun to see the unique outfits that Yuna, Riku, and Pain wear in this game. It's fun to mess around with this game's admittedly great battle system. It's fun to dive back into the world of Final Fantasy X and see how it's changed in the years since. It's fun to see Yuna sing her ass off in arguably one of the best bangers in Final Fantasy. Do I think that this game hits as hard as Final Fantasy X? No, I don't. Do I think that it has the same level of nuance as Final Fantasy X? No, I don't. But it's a fun time. The emotional beats still happen, and they still hit, just not quite as hard. I understand why in the moment, at release, this game may have been a bit of a disappointment. But with nearly 20 years of hindsight, it's hard for me to look at this as a bad game. I can't recommend it enough if you're just looking for a wacky, silly, and fun JRPG to play uh, without judgment from your friends. Oh. Oh. Oh, you're, you're gonna get judged by your friends. My bad. Peace. Many summoners used to cross these plains, their hearts heavy with the weight of their pilgrimage. I was no different. But the calm lands we knew have changed. 